Um, my title is Nostalgia in Europe after Brexit. So I'll be reading my text and during my, during my presentation there will be a two minutes a video as well they will present to you. So, um, immigrants, the other, the foreigner, has become one great issue in Europe and also in the West. The results of the last referendum in June 2016, in which a small majority of the voters has opted for the United Kingdom to leave the European Union in the so-called Brexit, evidenced a crescent worry of the population regarding the matter. The recent election of the US President Donald Trump was also based on his serious commitment to tackle immigration. The aftermath of Brexit brought some concerns about how migrants were being negatively portrayed independent of their legal status. These views and misperceptions about migrants are translations, I shall argue, that, that may cause people to be excluded and oppressed. They may crystallize distorted views in relation to people's behavior, how mi migrants understand the world and their ways of life, creating anxieties of inclusion. In being portrayed mainly in a negative way, some of these conceptions may become fixed associations, labels, that could impact on their integration. Thus, decreasing the possibilities of immigrants to live a fulfilling life and to fully occupy their place in own society. One symptom of this was the increased number of racism being reported after Brexit. Racism was being directed to all sorts of migrants from many different backgrounds. Many of them had a legal right to live in the UK, such as Europeans exercising treaty rights, refugees, asylum seekers, non-EU citizens with live to remain, and also British born citizens, members of minority ethnic groups. Indeed, having a legal right to live in a country does not necessarily mean to be fully integrated in that society. So, and I have a quote from Karis that uh, talks about that, that uh, equal right, legal rights are important, but they are not sufficient. Beyond what is secured by a legal right to stay, some tensions may arise between migrants and non-migrants that could bring challenges for the inclusion of the latter. To migrate brings massive challenges. One must leave their home, what is known, what is familiar. Migrants may experience solitude, loss, bereavement, fear, sadness, homesickness, nostalgia, regardless of the reasons why they left their home country. At the same time, it's known that Europe is facing a crisis, a decay of its values that have been eroded since modernity, leading to uh, the death of God or the devaluation of the grand narratives, what the German philosopher Nietzsche called nihilism. The, this nihilism brought a feeling of nostalgia, of not being at home, make the familiar and familiar, as people may feel these devalued values as external to them. This nostalgia could also be perceived in some of the Brexiters, people who voted for Brexit, uh, when claiming a return to British values. However, without exactly clarifying what the, these values would be. Thus, the experience of nostalgia seemed to be an experience shared by both migrants and non-migrants. Migrants for the specific movement of having to left their home and to live somewhere else in the Western European, um, um, to live somewhere else, and Western Europeans by being immersed in the nihilism alluded by Nietzsche. Hence, the encounter between migrants and non-migrants could be an interesting source of mutual uh, conversation and, and opportunities. My intention in this paper is to address how this conversation could, could be. In order to do so, I will discuss Barbara Casson's text of Corsican Hospitality, in which she addresses the issue of feeling at home and nostalgia from the perspective of language instead of territory or country. In doing so, Casson might be signaling that nostalgia and the feeling of being at home has a broader dimension. It may indeed be related to our human condition and may help us to understand the feeling of homelessness that could be affecting Europeans and migrants. I will explain how Kassan develops her views of not being at home in nostalgia. Then I will briefly explain the feeling of homelessness brought by Nietzsche's nihilism. And finally, I will present a two-minute audio of a case study in which I will present a conversation 
a possibility of rediscovering home from encounters from a migrant and a non-migrant. I argue that the search and finding of one's home may include the partial sharing of some other's home. Um, so um, this text I, I took is from the book that we will be reading this afternoon, part of this book, is the first text. So in this book, um, the title is When We Are Ever at Home. So specifically from the text I, I'm talking about, uh, of Corsican hospitality. In the text, Barbara Casson, a French philosopher who was born, raised, and lived in Paris her entire life, questions her feelings of going home, of being at home when traveling to Corsica. Corsica is an island which is part of France, but is located southern from France and nor north of Sardinia. Casson does not have ancestors in the island. She never spent her childhood or youth in Corsica. But she claims that every time she went to Corsica, she felt strongly that she was returning home, but she was not home. She says, maybe it's because I have no home, or maybe it's because it's when I am I'm not home, then I feel most at home, in a place that feels like home. When are you ever at home, she asks. Cassin connects uh, this feeling uh, with nostalgia. She then related what she feels about being at home in a place that's not familiar to human fiction. She carries that, uh, this analysis comparing it with the poet Greek Homer, posing that Homer is a fiction uh, himself because nobody is uh, certain if he wrote or not Odyssey or if he was a kind of fiction created. Uh, so she questions if nostalgia could also be a fiction, but a chosen fiction, a human fiction, in which the best way to be back home is to be in a home that is not one's own. That was the way she felt about Corsica. She claims that a homeland, like language, is something that doesn't belong. In doing so, Cassan exam exam examines the idea of homeland beyond the usual concepts of territory or as an affiliation to a country or related to blood or land. She thinks that nostalgia is not simply homesickness and then return to home and, and they return to home. She went through the etymology of the word nostalgia and found out that she is a Swiss German word created in the 17th century and its meaning was to describe nostalgia as an illness, the pain of return. Although nostalgia was deeply present in Homer Odyssey, the word was not invented, the word was invented much later, so she analyzed the, the Odyssey and um, she feels there are a lot of sense of nostalgia, although at that point the was nostalgia was not created. It was created much uh, later in the 17th century and it's something related to uh, illness, like nostalgia, like fibromyalgia, this suffix algia uh, means uh, illnesses, conditions. So when the word was put together, it meant, meant mainly homesickness. And she's trying to kind of um, uh, leave this um, uh, search, or search other meanings for that. Although nostalgia was deeply present in Homer's Odyssey, the word was invented much later. Although Kassan has explored the meaning of the word nostalgia within European languages, it reminded me of the word used in Brazilian Portuguese, borrowed from Africa in a dialect called Kizingombe, which is, um, which is called Banzo. Banzo, this word, meant a feeling of nostalgia and homesickness that the African slaves had after being trafficked to Brazil. It led, uh, this feeling of Banzo led to movements of resistance, escape, including the suicide uh, and escape from, from traffickers, which means that the word nostalgia can be accompanied of other meanings that Cassandra did not explore as she kept her analysis within the framework of European languages. Coming back to Cassin, she must be signaling that being at home in nostalgia are feelings that are perennial to humanity, perhaps a part of what con constitutes, constitutes us as human beings, as a language is something that doesn't belong. Cassin tries to think nostalgia and being at home as an experience free from all belonging, from roots. For that, she poses, in what ways can we say that nostalgia is a feeling that defines Europe? 
Kasson brings some interesting points in thinking homeland and nostalgia beyond uh, usual ideas of territory or land, nationality or land. In doing so, she connects it, to it with language, something that doesn't belong. Kasson questions if nostalgia is a feeling that defines Europe. My next step is to relate this Kasson's questions to another, que to another important question raised by the German philosopher Nietzsche. Nietzsche was born in 1844 and he died in 1900. So the last 11 years of his life, he was uh, severely ill. So um, he had a, just, just, I think, 20 years of uh, work published, uh, work that he could he could done. And in the end, Nietzsche was stateless because he was born in Prussia, and he spent most um, part of his life working in in Switzerland. And then she became stateless in that that period. So, um, okay. Uh, so my next my next step is to relate the custom questions about um, raised uh, by Nietzsche, which is the nihilism that um, it started to affect Europe after modernity. This event, I shall argue, brought a sense of nostalgia and homelessness that are points discussed by Casson. My view is that this sense of nostalgia and homelessness brought by nihilism would be a shared feeling with many non-Western migrants living in the West. There's a feeling that could be shared in conversation. But let's clarify the meaning of nihilism. So, um, my topic is now Nietzsche's nihilism and being not at home at one's own home. So God's dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. Thus spoke Nietzsche in the book Gay Science. Nietzsche associates the death of God as the historical moment in which the values of the Western society that had their start since Socrates and Plato had entered into decline after modernity. This event of the devaluations of values he called nihilism. One effect of nihilism is the feeling of nostalgia and disenchantment. Um, so I have these two uh, quotes of John Carroll and also the, a novel uh, that Herman has uh, called Glass Beat Game that translates kind of the sense of homelessness brought by nihilism. We live in a world in which doubt is the prevailing human condition in relation to big questions of meaning. He describes how it affects people in our days. On the one side, their perceived pessimism, disenchantment have arisen, accompanied by rampant consumerism. The upper middle class elites with their high culture have lost their way. On the other hand, much of what people still do disguise a search of meaning. And this quote from the Glass of Beach is that, um, this, again, this thing about meaning, um, that they say that uh, they could, people, uh, terms about the Europeans could no longer accept the consolation of the church and could obtain no useful advice from reason. These people moved spasmodically on through life and had no belief in a tomorrow. Uh, this kind of nihilism doesn't affect only how a uh, Western might feel, but also it is in root in institutions, policies, curriculum, and endorsement of certain ways of life, consumerism, entertainment, among others. Blake and Law also explain how the nihilism affects the Westerns. So I have these three quotes. Um, one is for Nietzsche, what does nihilism, nihilism mean? The highest values devalue themselves, the, the aim is, liking, is lacking, why finds no answer. And this from Nigel Blake at all in 2000, values have become merely conventional. They are experienced as external to us, as things we do not recognize ourselves in or identify ourselves with. And then this one from Messenger, the fact that nihilism is the unkindest of all guests, however, suggests that he makes our home itself foreign and alien. His chill figure is not simply unwelcome, it renders us homeless. Um, according to Nietzsche, man killed God because he no longer believed in the metaphysical world, the fake world created. created um, so, however, if God is dead and the West is still immersed in nihilism, human beings still did not create any other basis that could replace the vacuum left by this event. Hence, nihilism left them with the feeling of void, of lack of meaning and aims, in other, in other words, a sense of homelessness and nostalgia. It seems that uh, the nihilism posed by Nietzsche was in the West 
has in the West the effects of not being at home in nostalgia alluded by Barbara Casson. However, we must remember that after the second half of the last century, Europe became the new home for many migrants who came from all, all parts of the world. Some came as labor force from ex-colonies, some as asylum seekers fleeing war persecution, some moving from other European countries due to freedom of movements or the European Union. People who left their home and might also be affected by the same feeling of nostalgia or not being at home. It might be that Westerns and the migrants share the sense of nostalgia. If this is correct, then the other, the foreigner, the alien, the migrant, might be no longer unfamiliar. It might be that sharing the sense of nostalgia, of not being at home, makes us familiar and acquainted. The encounter of minorities with the wider society can also provide to both sides experiences and ways of life that may not be, uh, uh, that they may not be familiar with. Uh, um, but they can open up possibilities to reevaluate views of the other, to create new meanings, or I would say, to inhabit other homes or perhaps open up ways to recreate home. So I now uh, I'll show you a story. So in order to illustrate my views, I will present you now with the case of John and Adam. So John will tell you his story. This is John. Hi, I'm John. I will tell you a story of how I encountered and became friends with Adam and his family. How this relationship has brought me new experiences which I hadn't experienced in my own culture. I was working for the same company as Adam. He had moved there from Eastern Europe some years before. We knew each other, but nothing more. One day, I stopped for tea, as I often did in the communal area. Adam was there getting coffee. I noticed he was wearing a football scarf. It happened to be my team. We had a quick conversation regarding last night's result. Strangely enough, we very, very quickly became friends, good friends. When I met Adam, I was single. Adam was married with two beautiful children. He and his wife were both Catholic. They wanted to baptize their son, their new son, Arthur. They had asked me to be godfather. I was shocked. I'm an atheist. My circle of friends are all atheists or non-religious. How could I fulfill any needs of this child? Adam explained to me, he trusted me, and the important part was the role I could play in this child. He also told me he was inviting another friend of his, Anna. She was Christian, and it was going to be her job to make sure the child had Christian values. And she was also going to be a godmother. That made me feel a lot happier. More the point, it was not going to be a problem that I was not a religious person. I became involved with Adam and his family, as a result, I came into contact with different rituals and then realised we hadn't lost a share. They were all based around common values. Meeting Adam and, become, and becoming involved in his family brought me new experiences which I had not encountered previously within my own friends and my own culture. The, friend, the friendship had made me aware of different cultural perspectives. As a result, I found all of these a very positive experience. John's and Adam's story can be interesting to identify how the encounters that are already happening in everyday life between the wider society and minority ethnic groups can bring new experiences and other meanings and ways of life, making what is unfamiliar familiar. Indeed, a lot of information can be available on the internet or YouTube or in books and museums. However, the encounter with the other may take, a, may take us to another level of, ex of experience which is to live that moment with the other in its intensity. Also, to create possibilities where meanings can be deconstructed, constructed or reconstructed, out of this shared lived moment. In inhabiting for a while Adam's home, John could experience a ritual, the baptism of a child, which brings Adam and his family to a certain feeling of home. In that case, to be a godfather was connected to a Christian tradition that started in the century too. However, after the death of God, the nihilism and the devaluation of the, these values, this practice entered in disuse in most of the West. This kind of ritual is not only present in the Christian ritual, 
that it can't be found in other cultures such as China. And I found this term Gandhi that is similar to the idea of God the Founder but with no, with no religious meaning. In sharing Adam's uh, home, John could reconnect with the past, with ancient practices that could be shared between different cultures, but with different meanings. Um, um, so this kind of ancient practice may shed light to new meanings or to recreation of other meanings or senses of home. It might be that he, um, uh, migrants and non-migrants, due to their own circumstances, are sharing the feelings of nostalgia and homelessness, either by the Europeans living in a disenchanted and nihilistic West, or by migrants' displacements for their own home, trying to make the West their home. It might be that the encounters that they are already happening, one of, one of those I presented today, can result in new ways of feeling at home not only by using the resources of Cassin as a chosen fiction, but also in dialogue with the other, recreating meanings, temporary homes, shared homes. So my conclusions are that, it's like sharing thoughts and conclusions that, both Nietzsche and Cassin pose nostalgia and the feeling of not being at home as a European problem. Although Nietzsche named the nihilism and made a wider analysis of the problem, Cassin makes an account bringing into question issues of our time. It seems that Cassin's argument could be considered only a symptom of the nihilism alluded by Nietzsche, and indeed her original way of in reinterpreting nostalgia could be further explored, explored, although she keeps her analysis mainly within Europeans only. However, in the last half of the last century, Europe has received immigrants from many parts of the world. Many are already now European citizens, and they may constitute part of what the West is now, and, may, and they may partake a role in its future. Therefore, if nostalgia and the feeling of homelessness is affecting both migrants and non-migrants, the analysis of this event must take into consideration the possible task migrants, their integrations, and their ways of life may have it into understanding nihilism in our times and in creating responses to it. A conversation could shed light to the shared feeling of nostalgia, uh, and this could be a point to be further explored. John's story showed us that we can feel at home in an unfamiliar home. Nostalgia can bring us together, either being migrants or non-migrants, and perhaps it could be a way to connect us with other experience of what it means to be human. Very good, Marina. Thank you. Should we just go to questions? Yeah. Oh, we can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can. I have a question. Um, I was just—I just want to. I was just wondering. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but um, it seemed. Were you describing two kinds of nostalgia? Maybe one that's sort of, and I guess a nihilistic kind of nostalgia. So this—this this is the sort of nostalgia that maybe was present during the Brexit debate, so a sort of nostalgia for something um, that we've, a uh, nostalgia for the culture that existed pre-multiculturalism in, in the UK, or um, so a sort of uh, a nostalgia for something that was in the past that, that we don't have any longer, um, versus a nostalgia that is very close and very recent in a way, so for example the migrants they're nostalgic for, for a place that they, they just left, so it's a more of a sort of immediate connection. I guess that would be less nihilistic in a way, would you say? Or they have more reason to be nostalgic, maybe? I, I don't know. Um, yeah, this, this is an inter interesting question because um, I think they share the same feeling of nostalgia but in different ways. But I've, what I thought is that in this encounter, because they have different ways of life when these encounters happen, I think the meaning that can be constructed from these two different kind of experience of feeling nostalgia can perhaps help Europeans to make sense again of the values that they have lost because they can perhaps find new ways of life from these people that are coming that being within maybe within their own group they may not have be able to experience. So I think it goes both ways, but um, it doesn't mean that, for example, a, a migrant will not be nihilist in the sense. So it's, I think it can be kind of more complex. Uh, more complex, yeah. 
I, I have a question relating to this idea of enchantment, which I, I find fascinating. Um, in the John Cowell quote that you showed, um, we talked about um, nihilism as a, a, a disenchantment with uh, the way things are. Um, in some ways, though, a disenchantment can be a positive thing, uh, thinking of Odysseus mm -hmm. um, and his, his return home. Mm -hmm. um, the, in the Odyssey, he spends what was it, seven years on an island, enchanted mm -hmm. by, by the, the sorceress Circe. Um, and it was his disenchantment that, that permitted him to sort of see the illusion of, of his circumstances and then to, to start the journey, the journey home. Um, so I, I wonder if, if disenchantment could also be the beginning of a, a journey back home as well as a, a sort of a, a loss that could be viewed in a positive sense as well? Or do you yeah, I, I, I don't believe in static. I think um, there's always have to be a movement, have, always have to be something moving you forward. And I see these, uh, some possibilities of re-enchantment. And I think maybe, the, uh, I think my point was the other as the possibility to, to, to create a sense of re-enchantment from experience that is not are not um, common to a certain experience that you have in everyday life. Mm. I think there's, there are many ways that this can happen, but I think in that paper, I, I try to focus more on the experience, that these experiences can be, uh, sometimes they can be are portrayed as negatively, but uh, these other, they may have ways of life that, uh, like what happened with um, this case this study, uh, with John, uh, to be part of the life of that child is something that re-enchanted his world because he, for, for his science circle, he wouldn't have the opportunity to have his experience if it was not through this encounter with Aidan. So, uh, so my question, I, this is one, something I was trying to argue is that how this encounter with something, someone that has made a perspective of a life so different from mine can give me ways that I can reconnect with my past because this idea of a baptism is not something that it was Christian but it is present in other cultures and it can have a more ans ans ancestor way that is not exactly religions so it in somehow make people reconnect to other because John had the opportunity to be in the life of, of, of Arthur that is the child so it may makes human beings recreate new meanings using um, uh, with these encounters and um, learning from these new, these ways of life that uh, they encounter with this person that's so different from for what I am. So, so they could view enchantment without its sort of value connotations of negative or even positive, but they could view enchantment as a as a uh, an engagement, if you like, or a connection with something. Yeah. So, so you're, you're sort of engaged in, in a world, or connected to something, uh, and that, that provides meaning, I suppose, or a sense of value. Yes, but uh, there's an ethical issue as well in terms of meaning and value. So, in terms, of then, I, then I was needed to explain that to what is life affirmative and life denial. So, how to make this experience to be something that is being affirmed by both sides. Mm -hmm. There's something that can be a kind of an encounter that is positive for both ways. So in terms of life affirming, because there's a medical dimension. It's it. thank you. Can I ask a question? Uh, I think my question is uh, related to Alison's question about the two senses of nostalgia. You say. I correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, toward the end of your presentation, mm -hmm. you said something like the sense of nostal nostalgia is something which brings people. I heard a kind of retrospective tone in the way you uh, read this book. Uh, retrospective in a sense that the people's um, sense of shared past together. I do not mean that your point do not necessarily mean this, but the way, one way to uh, 
interpret what you have mentioned is like retrospective sense of nostalgia uh, brings people together with the shared sense of tradition. Uh, is that the kind of foundationalist drive which is implicit in your reading this book or potential reading of this book? It's, it's kind of a potential. Yeah. But do you support, do you endorse the position? The, uh, so, uh, like, like retro retrospective sense, retrospective um, turn toward the past is the basis uh, which people can share. Um, kind of foundation. I think my intention, which is the feeling of nostalgia that is affecting, like uh, nostalgia that uh, as a uh, kind of part of human condition is affecting either the nihilist, nihilist Western that he can find, find meaning in their own home, and this feeling of homelessness that, can, that the people who move to another country may feel as well. I think it's that nostalgia that affects all these people in a certain way, to a certain extent, depends on the context of them. That's the kind of a shared value or shared um, humanity. And then, uh, for the West, in which values the value after the, the death of God, this other who brings something that is different from what he lives on everyday basis, how this, this maybe value-based or ways of life that this other brings to them can be a way, in, when this encounter happen, happens, to resignify, recreate meaning from this in a way that can re-enchant a world that is is still permeated by a nostalgia of something that is in between, that had sense in the past, has no sense now, but the other can help to reconstruct the meaning of it through this sense of nostalgia. So, so, you're, saying, so you're saying that the sense of luck, luck itself is a kind of common bond people can share. Luck. 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 Yeah, could, yeah, yeah, could be, yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's through pain, through nostalgia, that we can, that you can uh, learn more from that. Any other questions? Can I be a little bit biographical? Because yes. when I was about forty, um, I've only been to about five Christian weddings. Probably not very many at that age. Well, I've been to at least 10 Indian weddings. And on the whole, I much preferred being at the Indian weddings because I felt less alienated than I did from the Christian ones. Um, now, that seems to kind of go with your story quite nicely. But I suppose I'm also t slightly worried that I was, uh, that there was an element of the exotic there, that I could relate to the Indian wedding more easily, precisely because it was further away and different. And so could there be a, a false value in there? Or is that the kind of indirect route that you think you need, or I need it, and so on, to bring people together? I think that depends the way you look at that, in terms mm. of this exotic. Is that exotic is because it's different from me, and that I can have a um, shared value in terms of I see as important as I am, or is that exotic that a way I, I rotulate it or put a label on that? Mm. So I think it depends on the way uh, you look at that and the way you value the other and in a way this relationship, they, 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 it happens. I think you uh, should read Fraser's Golden Bough, or rather Wittgenstein's commentary on Fraser's Golden Bough. Fraser, Sir so James Fraser, was an early anthropologist who in 1919 published this very long book called The Golden Bough. And it looks at ritual practices in many parts of the world, especially in quotation marks, primitive cultures. And so Wittgenstein reads this and is very critical of Fraser's uh, kind of ethnocentric approach to it. And what he's looking for is underlying patterns of similarity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More of a comment than a, than a question. Um, goes back to, once again, what Alison was saying about the uh, 
two expressions of, of nostalgia. Um, one for a sort of a far away, distant, sort of mythical mm. foundation of the past, uh, and one that we can associate with, with nationalism in some way. Um, and one with the, the, the sort of a, a more immediate loss of, of something um, which we can associate perhaps with the refugee experience. Uh, it strikes me as interesting that um, these two groups in Britain, at, at the very least, um, refugees from other countries and the nationalists uh, within, um, within Britain come into conflict with each other over, if you like, well, not over nostalgia, but certainly um, the, the nationalists in Britain uh, kind of driven by a nostalgic understanding of their own, um, their own uh, homeland. And refugees, really through no fault of their own, uh, 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 have a different sense of nostalgia. But it just strikes me as interesting that um, both have this sense of, of uh, something that's been lost for both parties. Um, perhaps on different scales, of uh, temporal scales. Perhaps uh, we're thinking about the um, experience of the refugees. I mean, we, we talk about them having, you know, a, a very real sense of loss of a, of a homeland through war or, or some such. Um, but as soon as they are away from that original setting, then the, the reality that they're looking back upon starts to fade, I suppose, because it becomes a, uh, a different experience. Um, so that, that's more of, more of a comment than anything else. But if we could go back to, to the comment near the beginning about Cassine Kass makes about the fiction of oneself, um, I find that a very interesting idea, um, and that we, we construct a sense of ourselves. Um, to what extent do you think nostalgia might play into that sense of the construction of one's, one's own fiction? I think the fiction has this problem that this sense of nostalgia can make us over-idealize what we, we lost or what we don't have. I was remember what Alison was saying today when she went... <laughs> can I use it as an example? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what time? My case is third. She was saying, we were saying something about uh, when you went, came to Japan, uh, you wait in a certain restaurant, and then you went to each of those restaurants now, and the oh, food was not, <laughs> was not uh, taste as she thought it was. Oh, really? And so what was my point it was, I think the food was the same, maybe, the expectations, or the fiction that she created in her mind, of the how it was so delicious, how tasteful. This nostalgia she created of the food <laughs> may have, I'm just talking your words, <laughs> may have, but I want to use as an example. Sometimes uh, we, we get nostalgic about something that's not there. And because that feeling so strong, we can over create an ideal of that that is not there. It's there because the way we feel about it or maybe it doesn't may not respond to reality. So, so. Well, I guess my, my kind of follow-up question to that is: Is it ever any other way? I mean, if we think about we can perhaps think about fiction of one's own past and one's, yeah. as as a as a problem, as something that, mm -hmm. that we shouldn't be doing. Uh, that mm -hmm. It should be real, unrealistic. But I wonder if there's something inherent in the human condition that that that, that sort of makes this happen anyway regardless of whether we want to or not. Um, you know, we, we may look at the world, to use the, the um, idiom, through rose-tinted glasses. So as we look at the past in a particular way, um, but can we ever escape that? Um, I think that's, that's quite a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could, I could, I could answer that. I'm not expecting to answer <laughs> yeah, it. But then, um, but then I think that's the kind of thing that Nietzsche said about the meaning that we are the animals who are going to die, who knows that we are going to die, and we're always trying to, it's something that's in, back of, in the back of our heads that's trying to make meaning of, of, um, of our existence. Maybe this is a curse that we not get rid of. But I don't need, know. <laughs> need it be a curse? Because I think what you're getting at is that if you take a concept like home, 
as most people have it, that concept wouldn't be available to us if there weren't fictions of her. Okay. You could say the same thing about falling in love with somebody. Mm -hmm. We can't fall in love with somebody unless there are traditions of courtly love in the past, mm -hmm. or Romeo and Juliet stories, or pop songs about love. So all those fantasies actually create the vocabulary in which something can happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that Derrida says, as if our fictions were not part of our real world. Of course they are part yeah. of the real world. Yeah. Thank you for that. So thank you very much, Maria.